Hey, somebody needs to adjust the dial. You have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to The Professional Noticer. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. This week, the professional noticer is sponsored by Books for Veterans. The Veterans Administration in Washington, D.C. has asked for 10,000 Andy Andrews books, and I'm personally donating as many as I can. But to reach this number, I need your help. What we're able to do to make that easier for you is for every $12 donation you make, a hardback book will be sent to the Veterans Administration for the veterans, their families, and for the employees of the VA. That $12 will cover the cost of the book, the shipping and handling. Or you can purchase one of these awesome Books for Veterans t-shirts and your purchase will include a book sent in your name. So whether you can make this a personal gift or a corporate donation, just go to andyandrews.com slash veterans. This can be added to a website purchase done as an individual entry or in conjunction with a Books for Veterans t-shirt. Thanks very much for your support. Observations and answers, that's what we do here on The Professional Noticer. And as you know, we love it when somebody comes to the table with both. And we have that today. We, we have a guy today, an author that I have wanted to have on this podcast since the very beginning. He is a, get this, he is a missionary novelist. And uh, he and his wife have served as full-time missionaries for 48 years. They lived in Europe for 22 years where they planted and pastored churches in Oslo, in Munich, in Berlin. And he currently serves as the European representative for Ministry Outreach Foundation. He has written some of the best books. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But for now, please welcome Randall Arthur. Randall, hey, how are you? Thank you, Andy, for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Man, I am so glad. You you significantly impacted my life 32, 33 years ago when, mm-hmm. when you published Wisdom Hunter. That, that book had just a, a significant effect on, on me and my wife. Uh, we had just, just gotten married. Uh, Polly and I have been married 35 years now, and so that that book came early in our marriage, and and we distributed quite a few of them there to other people. Yeah. But thank you. Um, t- tell me, just I, I guess I, I I I'm so fascinated by that book. But what is your religious background? Well, uh, I, I hesitate to name the denomination. <laughs> <laughs> but it was hard-lying legalistic. Uh, most of the pastors in this denomination were authoritarian, uh, dictatorial, and uh, all across the denomination, there was this standard list of do's and don'ts that had been added to the Bible and that were taught to us in the name of God. Uh, Christian and, and this men. is where, this is the background from which Wisdom Hunter was created, right? I mean, what was the situation going on then in your life? Well, uh, I became a believer very early in life, and I was trained at a a, a very legalistic Bible college, and I was hungry. Uh, I, I loved God, and I wanted to devote my life to Him. And so I put all of these professors on a pedestal, uh, because they were the experts. And uh, again, we were taught a lot of extra biblical rules. For example, uh, Christian men were not allowed to have long hair or hair that touched your ears. You had to have a military style haircut. Uh, women could not wear pants. Uh, we could not listen to any music that was syncopated, you know, that made you move. Uh, only the King James version of the Bible was allowed. No movie theaters, no table games with cards or dice. And it would have been one thing if these 
standards had been taught in the name of our denomination or as the preference of the churches, but they were taught in the name of God. And so it became a measuring stick for judging everybody's spirituality. And everybody in this camp, they they were judges, uh, very little grace, very little mercy. And if you failed to live up to these standards, then you were considered a, a neo-evangelical, a compromiser, carnal, and maybe not even a true believer. So I grew up in that environment. And uh, when my wife and I moved to Europe as missionaries, she was 19, I was 23. And I know this sounds pathetic, but because of the way we had been raised, we really believed that we had a monopoly on truth. Uh, we were taught that every Christian who was different from us wasn't just different, but they were wrong, they were blind, they were ignorant, they were defiant. So we went to Norway actually believing that we were Norway's only hope. And I laugh at that now, but... Uh, we had intended to start a church for the Norwegians, but the church that developed became an international congregation. And so quickly, we were working with people from 10, 15, 20, 30 nations, and they came from many uh, denominational backgrounds with a lot of different convictions and preferences in life. And you know, I would get frustrated with these people because I was trying to elevate them to our standard. And, you know, they would shake their heads and they would say, I, I just don't think God says what you claim this morning that he says. And I would argue with them. Uh, but finally, they helped me to see over a two-year period uh, that I was blind, uh, that I had been misled. And when I realized that I had been misled, uh, I was cut free like a pendulum that was strung up as far to the right as you can go. And as I swung from that position, I went through phases. But the first phase was I became very angry. Uh, you know, did these people mislead me intentionally or were they blind? Uh, Eventually, I decided I wanted to shout some truths and insights to my peers, but I knew that they would not sit down at a table and have a civilized conversation. You know, the moment that they de uh, detected that I was off base or wayward, <laughs> right. know, they would dismiss me from the table. You know, sure. You have nothing we want to hear. So uh, I decided, you know, maybe if I could write uh, an adventurous story and somehow wrap these insights that I was learning into the story to illustrate them in a real life drama, you know, maybe some of those people would start reading the book, get caught up in the adventure, and then be kind of slapped in a gentle way with these insights. Uh, so I I told my wife, I, I'm going to write a novel. And of course, she laughed. Um, I had never had any literary experience. But I started writing. And that's a long, long story. And I'm not going to bore you with that. But uh, it, it probably took five or six years before the book ever came to print. And when it did come to print, we were now living in Munich, our second our second city, working with our second church plant. Now did the did the home people did they did they find out about you when you were in Oslo? Or did you just go on to Munich and they had no clue? I mean because I'm assuming that when the book came out, it was like a an explosion. But Go ahead. Well, I, I, I living in Oslo, uh, we were 5,000 miles away from our headquarters. And 
And, you know, they, they contacted us very little, actually. Uh, it seemed that they, they weren't really interested in you unless some of your supporting pastors were complaining or your home church. So we just carried on and made the changes that we were comfortable with and, you know, started using the NIV. Uh, oh, for my the, gosh. For, I, know, oh, I know. Oh, I know. Oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a lot of these people in our congregation spoke English as a second language, and the old King James English just was not readable for them. So we had to use the NIV, and no, that was a, a difficult transition for me in the beginning. But uh, but anyway, we kept all that under cover. Uh, we moved to <laughs> Munich, planted our second church, and. You you got a church with with people from thirty different countries keeping it undercover, but you're five thousand dollars away or, or five thousand miles away, and you're probably not dancing too much. So. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, I, I knew that if this book ever went to press, uh, that I would be fired. And. Uh, when I got a call from Questar Publishers in Oregon saying uh, they would like to publish the book, they would like to offer me a contract to publish it across America and Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. I was honored, but it scared me to death. And uh, we were, we, this was, uh, in the fall of 1990. And they explained to me that if I signed a contract, the book, according to their timeline, would be published in April of 1991. And I said, I, I, I can't do it. And they said, you can't do it. People send us manuscripts all the time for us to publish. And now you're turning this down? And I said, well, now, we're not scheduled to return to the States until August of 91. And at that point, we will have turned our church over to new leadership. But if the book, if I sign a contract and the book goes to press in April and my mission board discovers it, I said they will fire me immediately. You were that sure that you oh. were going to be fired? Oh, absolutely. And I said they, they wouldn't even allow our kids to finish out the last few weeks of their school year. They wouldn't allow us uh, the time we needed to transition to the new pastor. They wouldn't allow us time for any closure. It would just be, you know, you're coming home now. <clears throat> and I said, I, I, I can't do that. And, uh, you know, my, my birth name is Randy Arthur Dodd. And so one of the editors said, well, what if, what if we published the book under a name that your mission board wouldn't quickly recognize? <laughs> and, and they said, that would give you time to uh, finish out your term from April to August. And, you know, that sounded deceitful. <laughs> but I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, probably nobody at the mission board really recognizes my middle name, Arthur. I said, so maybe I could just print it under Randall Arthur, and that's not really lying. Not really I mean, deceitful. It, it's yeah. your real name. That's my real name. <laughs> so I, I finally signed a contract. Uh, they published Wisdom Hunter in April of 91 under the name Randall Arthur. And to my shock, Andy, uh, the book became an immediate bestseller. And that scared me even more. Uh, I felt like it was a fluke. Uh, and it started getting rave reviews. Yeah, it's not a shock to me. I was part of that wave. Well, keep you know, going, I, keep going. One day, one day I, I'm in my office and Sherry says, Randy, you got a long distance call from the States. She said, it's Michael Smith. And I said, Michael W. Mm -mm. And she said, yeah, Michael W. 
I was like, oh my goodness. And, and he talked for 20 or 30 minutes. And a week later, I got a call from Stephen Curtis Chapman. And uh, it was almost too much. And, and then one day, you'll, you'll like this. Uh, I got a call from Tim LaHaye's office. And uh, the man said, Randy, as you know, Tim LaHaye has written several bestsellers, but none of them have been works of fiction. But he's thinking of writing his first fiction book. It's about the end times. And uh, he's read Wisdom Hunter. He loves your style. He wants to know if you will ghost write the book for him. And it's called Left Behind. And uh, <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> so I, I had to turn them down. And I don't regret that. But I explained that you know, we yeah, were Jerry, in the middle. Jerry Jenkins doesn't regret you turning it down either. No, no I'm sure he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't. Oh, and, and and on a side note, I, I joke with my family and say, I kind of take a little credit for The Chosen because I turned uh, Tim LaHaye down as a ghostwriter for Left Behind, and Jerry took it up. And Dallas, who's the Dallas. producer, of the, he grew up in that, era when uh, Left Behind became so influential and he was yeah. inspired by that. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, the book was published and it received all of these great endorsements. We came back to the States in August and the original copy had a little profanity in it and it was not meant to be gratuitous. I, I wanted the book to be realistic and authentic. And I, I included some profanity where I knew the characters would definitely use it. But as I remember, it was damn and hell stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was nothing more than that. Right, right. But uh, uh, there, there was a huge organization, and the name is slipping my mind, but they wanted to uh, market the book and endorse it, and it would have gone out to millions of people. But the uh, the CEO read the book, and he came across those words of profanity and said, "No, we we can't promote it." So the uh, publishing house uh, founder and president said, "Maybe we should clean up." the book and put out a clean version. And I thought, okay, uh, you know, I'll try to rework those five or six scenes, try to somehow maintain the intensity of the emotions without the uh, profanity. Just for the darn heck of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, I thought to myself then, well, before I take a copy of the book to my mission board and my home church, I'll wait until this cleaned up version comes to the market. But Questar kept postponing that, uh, that update. So finally, I, I was feeling so guilty. You know, I've got to take this to the president of our mission board and the Office was in Chattanooga, which is a two-hour drive from our home in Atlanta. So I'd made an appointment, and I went up, and at 11 o'clock one morning, I walked into the president's office with a copy of Wisdom Hunter, and I said, you know, I need to share something with you, and I don't think you're going to like it very much. Did you say, is, this is the damnedest story? And then he said, what the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I said, uh, you know, I've written a novel and it has become a bestseller. And the, the whole purpose of the book is to illustrate the destructiveness of hardline legalism. Uh, to show the destructiveness of authoritarian pastors. Now, keep in mind that this mission agency at the time had sent out 1,000 missionaries 
And those 1,000 missionaries were supported by 6,000 legalistic churches pastored by authoritarian men. <clears throat> and so what I was doing was nailing my uh, 95 thesis to the church door of this denomination saying, these are things I cannot agree to, even though they are promoted in the name of God. I think you guys are blind. I think you're wrong. So the president, he was shocked. He said, I'll work this into my reading schedule over the next two weeks. And then I'll let you know what I decide. So I drove home back to Atlanta. That same night, uh, the president of the mission board called me and said, Randy, I have spent the afternoon and the evening reading. I have completed three-fourths of the book. He said, I want your letter of resignation on my desk tomorrow morning. And I'm going to send out a letter to all 6,000 churches condemning you, condemning the book, and you will be blacklisted. You will never show your face again in our denomination. And I knew that was going to happen, but it was still a shock when it did happen. Uh, it's like, you know, you know that if you jump into a cold shower, your body tends to react. And you can try to mentally prepare for that and convince yourself, I'm not going to jump. But when the cold water hits you, you jump. Yeah. And uh, so it was it was a difficult time because stateside, all of our constituents, 100 percent were in this camp. And so when we were uh, excommunicated, we didn't have any friends, uh, even our home church a few months later where we had come to Christ, where we were baptized, where I was ordained, where we were married, where we were commissioned as missionaries, uh, they excommunicated us as well. You know, so that, that, was, that that is, uh, I mean, you say you didn't have any friends. You had a ton of friends. You just didn't know them yet. Yes. Uh, <laughs> because these people were reading your books. I was your friend. I just couldn't get to you, you know, and, yeah. and I, I, it just... Obviously, this has been more than three decades, but this still disturbs me because this is how people see Christians. And, yeah, yes. and obviously, obviously, we deserve the reputation. Yeah. So it's, but well, this, this book, I, I mean, I was not raised in a, in a, in a situation like you were, but this book still opened my eyes to a lot of things. And I mean, I've spent well, three decades recommending this book to people. Well, well, I'm honored. Thank you, Andy. And when I wrote the book, I was thinking only that uh, my denomination would be impacted if they would at all. Uh, you know, I wasn't thinking about Church of Christ or Assembly of God or Roman Catholics or any other denomination, but through the years, I've received letters from people all across the denominational spectrum saying, uh, you know, how much the book had uh, meant to them and encouraged them and helped them. So. Have you have you had the experience of any of those people who were visible in that push against you? Have you had any of them come to you since then and say, <laughs> say man, I'm so sorry we were wrong? Uh, it, it's uh, interesting that you would ask that particular question, because about two months ago, actually, uh, I got a call one day, and on the other end of the line was a voice I didn't recognize. He said, is this Randy Dodd, uh, Randall Arthur, the writer of Wisdom Hunter? And I said, yes. He said, my name is, and I live north of Atlanta he said, is it possible for you and me to meet? I desperately need to talk with you. And so we scheduled a, a lunch appointment. And I met him. And he 
told me about his past. He had been in my ex or my previous denomination for like 58, 60 years. And this was all that he knew. And he had been a very successful missionary pastor in South America. And he was almost a prima donna uh, in our camp because of his success. And missionaries came from all around South America to uh, meet with him and to view his work because it was just exceptionally fruitful. And the mission board called him back to the States and said, you know, will you build a, a church here and a Bible school here and raise up a whole crop of missionaries, you know, using all of your insights and inspire them and mobilize them? Uh, just bring up an army of new missionaries. He said, I'll do that. So he came back to the States. He started a church, started a Bible school, and suddenly he's mobilizing all of these men to go out. <clears throat> but last year, uh, he fell off the pedestal, and everybody in the denomination turned against him. Of course, at one time, they held him as a hero. Uh, and now he's all alone. He didn't know where to turn, and he remembered Wisdom Hunter. Uh, he remembered everybody condemning me, and he wanted to find out if I had survived, and he needed a friend. And he said, I, I have a question for you. He said, are there really elements of true Christianity outside of our denomination? Wow. And I said, brother, I said, our denomination is minuscule in the overall body of Christ. And he said, I, I, I can't even get my mind around that. He said, I've been submersed in this denomination all my life. He was he was running head first into what he was hoping was the possibility of the principle of forgiveness. Yes, 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 yes. But in our denomination, there was very little grace, not much at all, Andy. Uh, it, it, it was brutal. It was brutal. Um, but we we've since met with him on. Uh, other occasions, and we're trying to encourage him, and he's now discovering that indeed there are true believers outside of that denomination, and it's been eye-opening for him. And now he's going through a similar phase, you know, being angry with all of those who he feels now misled him, and 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 feeling guilty that he misled himself for so many years. Uh, but the truth is, there are still a lot of those churches across America. Yeah, yeah. You know, after Wisdom Hunter came Jordan's Crossing. Um, you've written Forgotten Road, A Quiet Roar, Brotherhood of Betrayal. What what inspired Brotherhood of Betrayal? Uh, that was my third novel. Uh, my first three novels, Wisdom Hunter, Jordan's Crossing, and Brotherhood of Betrayal, uh, were all born out of a lot of pain. Um. When I swung free from the far right, I continued to swing, and I swung way to the left. Uh, didn't even know who I was anymore, really, or what I believed, because it was going to take time for me to go back to ground zero or step number one and rebuild my whole belief system, because I felt like I couldn't trust any of those teachers anymore. So I had to go back and relearn. But in the process of going back to step one, I swung way to the left. And, you know, I was trying to fight my battles alone because, again, you know, I wanted to pull the mask off and say somebody helped the boy, uh, but I knew that nobody in my denomination would uh, be there to help me or give me. Uh, grace. So I tried to fight my battles alone as I swung through these phases of being angry, disillusioned, 
And then I finally reached the point uh, where I lost my heart for everything that was good, Andy. Uh, lost my heart for being a husband, for being a father, for being a pastor. And I, I often thought, you know, maybe I should just run away uh, to another country, take on a new identity, and be free from all of this, and then just chase dreams. Um, I did run away from home for a few weeks. Uh, my church actually gave me permission. They were my best friends, the ones in Norway, because they weren't of this legalistic mindset. They knew I was struggling. Uh, they loved me. Uh, they wanted to help me but I felt like they had never been a missionary or a pastor and they didn't really understand. And so I told them, I said, I just need to run. And uh, Sherry took our daughter back to the States for six weeks under the guise of visiting uh, the grandparents. And so I, I went before the church and said, I can preach over the next six Sundays, but my heart would not really be in it. I would just be a machine. I said, what I really need to do is run and, and just try to find out who I am and what I want in life. And I'll never, never be able to appreciate these people enough because as my dearest friends, they looked me in the eye and said, okay, if you need to run, then we set you free. Of course, if you make any stupid decisions along the way, we can't change the consequences, right? but run. And so I did. And in that running, uh, you know, God thankfully used some people, some experiences to start to change my heart and heal my heart. But I came close to abandoning everybody. And the book Brotherhood of Betrayal was birthed out of what easily could have been my, uh, my destiny. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a hard book. Uh, it's about a, uh, a North American couple that goes to Sweden and they have a very fruitful ministry and one morning, the men of the church are expecting the pastor to show up for a weekend retreat, and he doesn't show up. And they call his wife, and she says he left the house. And there are two stories in the novel. Uh, one of the stories is of the man and his choices. And the other story is about the wife and the three kids. And their life thereafter without uh, this husband and father. Um, so it's a hard story. But I, I've tried to show the, the ugliness of betrayal at many different levels. If someone betrays the church and they are broken and they want to be restored, and they're humbled, oftentimes the church, instead of embracing the people and forgiving them and trying to restore them, the church will betray them. Uh, and so I try to show betrayal at many different levels right. and how ugly it is. Yeah. How so it, you, was, I, it was birthed I'm, out of pain. I'm curious. Uh, How do I put this? I, I know, having grown up in the church and just watching and being a part of several churches and being also called to 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 work in a secular form, I. I I find many people um, 
have turned their back on God when, in fact, it wasn't God who did anything to them. It was the people. It was, you know, it was what what exactly. they think of as the church or and and so I, I'm I'm curious as as to what you think about the organized church today. Well, it's been my observation over 48 years of ministry that uh, there have been tens of thousands of people who were at one time loyal to their church, who have turned their back now on organized religion because of the fact that in some way they were hurt or betrayed or disillusioned by the church. And as you say, it was a pastor, it was a congregation, it wasn't God, but they've, they've turned their back on organized religion and they carry a lot of bitterness in their heart. Uh, I mean, and the church, I mean, it's only made up of humans, but, but we should be learning forgiveness by now. Should we not? Uh, we should learn what grace is. And I know that human grace is limited. Um, you know, and how do you know when you reach the edge of the human grace in your church? Uh, you don't. You don't know until you've passed it. And then that's when the hammer comes down and everybody turns against you. And there's no more grace and there's no more mercy. Um, it does seem it, amazing to me that the principle that Christianity is absolutely based upon, the principle of forgiveness, seems to be the one principle that we seem to ignore in our own personal lives. That's true. That just hey. it, that just never ceases to amaze me. Yeah. Um, when when we started our church in Munich, at that point, I was really tired of playing uh, politics, and I, I hungered just for authenticity. I, I wanted my church to be real. I wanted the people to feel comfortable enough that they could pull their mask off and say, somebody help the boy, somebody help the girl. So my wife and I started meeting once a month with the couples. And we were trying to build a forum where more and more they would feel comfortable and relaxed. And I think we'd been meeting for about uh, nine or 10 months when one evening we had one of our gatherings and it was in a home. There were 14 couples that showed up. So that's 28 people, 14 men, 14 women. We started at 6.30. And I said, I would like to ask a question to you this evening. And we'll let everyone who will answer it. I said, what is the greatest pain that you've ever experienced in life? But it can't be physical. And I said, I'll, I'll share first. So I shared with him uh, about my swing from legalism way to the left, losing my heart for everything that was good. <clears throat> and I think many people were shocked you know, to hear a pastor be that open. But, but they had become accustomed you know, to me at that point. So maybe they weren't too shocked. But... I knew that the outcome of the meeting would really depend upon the next two uh, ladies who were sitting beside me. Would they take the baton? And the first lady, when it was her turn, she just buried her face in her hands. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. 40 seconds. And then finally she looked up and tears are already streaming down her face. And she said, all right, my greatest pain 
She says, I've never shared this with anyone. Only my husband and my two kids know about this. She said, for seven years of my life, when my kids were young, uh, I was a addicted to prescription drugs. And she said, during those years, I created a hell inside my home for my kids and my husband. I abused my kids. She said, they're adults today. They still hate me. They will have nothing to do with me. She says, my husband sitting next to me threatened to divorce me many times. She said, he's here now only by God's grace. She says, what makes this story so sad is that we were a leadership couple in our church at the time. And I couldn't tell anybody. I kept it hidden. She said, I wanted so badly to pull my mask off and ask somebody to help me. But I knew that I probably would be rejected and never be forgiven. So I lived with it and it's ruined my relationship with my children. And that's the greatest pain that I've ever experienced. And she took 30 minutes to share her story. And a lot of the people were weeping. We started at 6.30 that evening. We finished at 3.30 the next morning. We never took a break. Every one of those people, 14 men, 14 women, took their mask off. And I, I didn't realize that there could be so much pain represented in so few lives. Uh, but a special bond was built that night between these people. And they all embraced each other. And going forward in our church, it wasn't unusual after that to have people stand up in a prayer request time and say, you know, pray for me and Bill. We're talking about divorce for the first time. And, and I know that some of you have been on the verge of divorce, but you fought back and your marriages have been salvaged. You know, and we now need your help. We need for you to love us, kick us in the pants, give us advice. Don't let us go, help us. Wow. Or pray for me as a mother. I'm really hating my 13-year-old daughter right now. And I've lost my wits. I don't know how to deal with her. Some of you have raised kids. You know what I'm talking about? Will you help me? And so that became something beautiful. And I've only experienced that type of authenticity in a church, in that one church. And I've always missed it ever since. But you, you can tell the lack of authenticity in a church during prayer request time when 100% of the prayer requests, cancer, leukemia, going to the anonymous, dentist, anonymous. Broken, broken leg, you know, everything is physical. But yeah. So, so how did you, how did you find your way back to the center? When did that, <laughs> when did you find that, that place? I don't know where the center is, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm 70 years old, and uh, my goal is to always be a learner, to always be a student, right? Uh, for as long as I live, and I have a hunger uh, for truth. Um, I'm always trying to find balance, so I'm just a student, still learning myself. And I, 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 I tell people because sometimes people read my books and they tend to, to view me through the books, of course, and they put me on a pedestal. Sure. And I tell sure. them, look, you know, I'm not an expert on the church or on the Christian life. I'm on the battlefield just like you are. Yeah. But uh, that, that's that's what I say. Just because I know some of this stuff yeah. doesn't mean I'm great at it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, t tell me a little bit about your life. What's happening, man? Oh, man, this is not your I, podcast. You don't need to ask me anything. <laughs> we, we'll have well, to talk. I, I, it, it does occur to me 
it does occur to me as we talk that you would love our church. Um, we go to church in a bar. Um, as uh, We're here on the Gulf Coast, and there's a place called the Florabama. Oh, and yeah. It, yeah. the Florabama is the biggest roadhouse in America. You know, Buffett wrote a song about it. It's been in two of John Grisham's books. It's in USA Today two or three times a year for something. And and so several years ago, we started a church there. We figured, you know, by the time church rolled around, there were probably some people still there. And <laughs> and um, and and today we're we're doing uh, two services uh, on Sunday mornings, nine and eleven, and they average seven to nine hundred per service. We got Easter coming up. Last Easter we had eight thousand people. And and we uh, we're baptizing them in the Gulf. We have the only baptistry in America that has dolphins in it, so <laughs> it's pretty amazing. We have we have a, 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 a history of awesome pastors. We've got a pastor now that he's been with us for like a year. A pastor and his wife John and April McIntosh, and they're just doing such a great job. And I just you know we have a lot of people there who forget they are not going to church anymore. They've never been to church. And they show up at this. You know, it it, awesome. it has turned into kind of a I, I guess a bucket list for some people. Like, wow. you know, you go to New York City, did you go to the Statue of Liberty? Of course. You know, and it's, we went to the beach. Where'd you go? We went to Orange Beach, Gulf Shores. Did you go to church at the floor of Bama? Yes, yes we did. And so it's um uh, it, it's an amazing place. We call it Worship on the Water. And well, Andy, you're, you're going to find this very interesting. Uh, you know, I, I've traveled a lot in my life. Uh, since moving back to the States 20-something years ago, I've led 126 mission teams, and over 80 of those have been to Europe across 20 different countries. But I travel a lot here in the States as well. And I tell people that, one of my favorite countries in the world is Norway. One of my favorite big cities in the world is Berlin. My favorite big city in North America is Montreal. But my favorite small town in the world is Fairhope, Alabama. Wow. wow. I love Fairhope. And I've stayed in the writer's cottage uh, two They're times. They're above Page and Pallet. Yeah, I, I've stayed in the Wolf Cottage a couple of times now for a month at a time writing, and I love Fairhope. I would love to retire there someday. You have got to come <laughs> see us next time you're in this area. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'll take you for a, a burger at Billy's Restaurant there in Fairhope. And, <laughs> but I would, I would, man, we would love to have you and have you at the church and, and you know, my— my wife, our boys are grown now. Um, they're young adults, twenty-one and twenty-four. But uh, I, I would, I would just love for my family to meet you. Where are you today, by the way? Uh, south of Atlanta, about twenty miles. Okay, and and so, so, how long have you been back from Europe? Ooh, twenty-four years now. Really? Did you intend to stay home, stay, no, stay no, in the States this long? No. Uh, did I tell you about my mom and why no, we tell stayed? Me. Okay. Tell me. Uh, when we returned from Europe in 1998, we had planted our third church. It was in Berlin. And we came home for what we thought would be a year, year and a half furlough. And then we would return and plant a fourth church somewhere. Uh, but during that furlough, my mother, who was 81 at the time, underwent three major surgeries mm. and mm. the doctor said she might have three years to live. So we had been away from her for 22 years uh, and we had grandkids, uh, her grandkids. So I, I decided let's stay here in the States with her for her final years. And everybody in the family agreed. And we thought that would be three or four years. Right. Well, last November, Four months ago, she turned 105. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
So oh, we have my gosh. so we have stayed in the states all of these years. Randy, uh, she's going to outlive you. She probably will. At rec- I told her recently. I said you might as well plan on uh, preaching my funeral, and uh, she didn't <laughs> think that was funny, of course. But uh, but she's uh, she's vibrant. Uh, she's in her right mind. Uh, but it's something oh, that's that we more never... than more than you can say about me. So that's <laughs> great. <laughs> Hey, let me ask you this. Just a final <laughs> question. What what other writing projects are you working on? Well, I have the uh, the five novels, and I have a children's book called ABCs on the Move, which was illustrated by a, a, a local artist. Uh, I have a nonfiction book called Forty Six Stones, uh, letting go of notions, beliefs and tendencies in the evangelical church that uh, tend to be stumbling blocks. Uh, but now I'm actually working on an autobiography. And, but I'm, I'm doing this mainly for my kids and grandkids and, and grandkids me. to be. And, and me. Uh, okay, and Andy. I'll, yeah, I'll, make I it available. I'll make it available to the market. Uh, I, I hope to release it sometime next year, maybe in the fall. Yeah. That's great. Oh, man, how how can we help you? What can we do to help you? Well, just uh, I appreciate you inviting me to be interviewed. Uh, Any recommendation regarding the books would always be appreciative. Well, you Uh, got that. And we will have on the show notes how how to reach you, how to uh, we'll have connections with the books. We'll list the books, where to buy them and where where would you like us to buy them? uh, Amazon. Okay, it's good. Yeah. All right. Good. And the books are available. The books are available as ebooks, and several of them are uh, available as audio books as well. Thank you, buddy, for yeah. being well, thank here. You. Thank you for taking the time. I am so honored. This is one of my most fascinating interviews ever. I, I just appreciate you being here. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for all the right. invite. I appreciate it. And we'll see and, you soon. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing that tiny bit of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme, written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Rawhide Jews for the cast and crew, provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by the Dellendam, America's largest cruise ship. Is cruising in your future? If so, you might as well go where the cruising industry is going, and that is big. 30 years ago, the SS Norway, carrying 2,000 passengers, was the world's largest cruise ship operated by Norwegian Caribbean lines. Then, Carnival Cruise Lines produced the Venezia, which carried more than 5,000 passengers, followed by Royal Caribbean's Icon of the Seas, a gigantic ship that holds 7,600 passengers. But now, Holland America is launching the Dellendam. Every weekend during the summer months, this innovative cruise line is detaching the state of Delaware from the mainland United States for a 48-hour cruise into the Atlantic. All you have to do to be included is to be in Delaware after 9 a.m. on Saturdays during June, July, and August. What does the Dell and Dam boast of in the way of food and entertainment? Only thousands of restaurants, bars, and occasionally a sitting president of the United States along for the ride. It's not the love boat, it's the Dell and Dam, sailing on weekends this summer. <laughs>